everyone. Well, we have our first post on our forum. Steve Swearingham from Texas witnessed this scene. A female cardinal feeding a brown-headed cowbird. Well, I know what it is. Do you? If you have any comments, leave them in the forum. Flowers stop producing nectar if they don't get enough water. We haven't had rain in well about three weeks and our town actually imposes water restrictions so we're limited as to how much we can water flowers. So what happens then? Well, we don't have to worry about hummingbirds because a lot of backyards provide at least one hummingbird feeder. But what happens to wasps and bees? They go hungry and then they turn to your know, hummingbird feeders. And it's not always easy to get rid of uh, bees and wasps. Uh, things that I do not recommend to use to deter them is uh, Vaseline, any kind of oils, and please don't use any Raid. You can try using mint leaves if you grow mint in your garden. You can tie it around your hummingbird feeder, but then that you have to change quite often because mint leaves go dry and then they don't work on bees and wasps. Uh, what I do, when I get bees and wasps around my feeder is that I give them their own feeder. I make special nectar for them. It's five parts water and one part sugar. And I start by placing a little feeder like this close to my hummingbird feeder. You can use just a little saucer, fill it with nectar as well. So the first day the feeder is going to be very close. Let the bees and wasps discover it and they will enjoy it. And then every day I'm going to move it further and further away from the hummingbird feeder. And then of course when the rain comes, flowers will start producing more nectar. So try it out and let me know how it works for you. Hi David, when I read this question from Gary Hogarth, I was a bit puzzled. Here's what he writes. I know robins eat worms and all sorts of grubs, but I saw the weirdest thing on the golf course the other day. In the middle of one of the fairways, a robin was attacking a small snake about eight inches long. In the end, the robin won and carted off its victim. Is this unusual behavior or are robins that aggressive and carnivorous? Hi Gary. When I first read your question, I thought that perhaps you'd mistaken a very large nightcrawler for a small snake. However, upon researching the topic, I discovered that on very few occasions, American robins will indeed kill very small snakes and even carry them back to their nest, ostensibly to feature their young. Back in 1969 in the Wilson Bolton, there's not one but two accounts of this unusual behavior for robins. You see, 99.99% .99 of the diet of robins is composed of fruits and invertebrates such as worms, and their digestive systems are likely adapted for those kind of soft foods and not a bony meal like a vertebrate serpent. It was interesting to read in one of the cases that the robin did not consume the snake itself, but instead carried it to its nest to feed it to a seven-day-old cowbird. I suppose that one really thinks about it, the act of killing a very small snake is not that different from dispatching a large earthworm, and robins can be quite vicious with their beaks. In one account, a robin actually killed a Stellar's jay by penetrating its skull with its bill in a competitive squabble. But I'm not aware of any description in the scientific literature of a robin actually picking at and eating a dead snake. That's not to say it doesn't happen. How often have you started your day half asleep, almost on autopilot, yet still managed to get everything done and made it through the day safely? Wouldn't it be just great to be able to switch off part of our brain to get some rest? Well, for years, scientists have wondered how certain birds can stay up in the air for a very long period of time. And turns out they do just that. The great frigate bird can stay up in the air for almost two months. And what happens is that they put half of their brain to sleep and continue soaring in the air. Dolphins and certain ducks are also capable of doing that. But what's so interesting about frigate birds is that they can actually fall asleep completely for a very short period of time and continue to fly at the same time. Well, that's a real autopilot. 
From England to Malta, I've covered several stories involving EU bird and habitat directives, and this week it's Bulgaria in the news. Bulgaria has beautiful coastlines and forests, lovely wine, and lots of history, but unfortunately not much in the way of environmental awareness. With an astonishing 29 species being on the red list, the EU is trying to figure out why birds like the Tang Malm's owl the white-backed woodpecker and the hazel grouse are thriving everywhere else in the EU but are endangered in Bulgaria. The Rila Mountains were traditionally a habitat for these birds and other species, and even though Bulgaria has created special protection areas, the local bird populations are still in decline. I'll come back to this story as it develops. Every day we hear stories about declining bird populations. But imagine if in 1973 Congress hadn't introduced the Endangered Species Act. Since then, the act has been under constant attack with 100 attempts to remove species from the list since 2014. But despite all the attacks, the ESA has helped protect the peregrine falcon, the Kirtland's warbler, and the woodstock, which were all on the brink of extinction but now have healthy populations and protected habitats. 85% of species on the list have stabilized and now seeing huge improvements in population. So if you live in the US, please keep an eye on the ESA to make sure it doesn't become endangered itself. I think the Cornell Leber Ornithology is a fabulous resource center. I love their Merlin app. I really enjoy using eBird. So I thought I would mention a contest that they run every month. Did you know that by logging your birds, even the birds in your backyard, you also help science? This is how Cornell tracks all the bird populations. So this month, eBird is asking you to log your checklist with photographs and or audio recordings. The birders who do that will then and qualify to be selected as the bird of the month. You can actually win a nice pair of binoculars. So good luck to all of you. I found that the picture that were submitted for this episode were rather emotional. I don't know how the judges could pick their favorite. So here are the top five. The fifth place is actually a tie, so we have six pictures. Have a look. And the winner is Corby Duchel with her picture of the Northern Cardinal. Isn't he so cute? Corby, we're sending you a Squirrel Buster legacy. Enjoy it. Have a beautiful week, everyone, and I'll see you next Tuesday.